Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to watch this broadcast, because what we'll discuss today and in the coming weeks is of the most pressing importance to all of us, whether here in Australia or to our many like-minded friends around the world. My name is Ricardo Bosi. I'm a published author and a business owner. I've consulted internationally on strategy, leadership, innovation and business continuity. I'm also a retired Australian Army Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. But most importantly, I'm the national leader of the Australia One Party. Since the arrival of COVID, despite the many differences between people, the one pressing concern we all share is that we have all struggled to understand the full nature of the threat that we are facing so that we might make the right decisions to return to a normal life on Earth. This 10-part series, Law of War, from Australia One, is intended to present information to help you understand these issues and, more importantly, to describe the plan of action to regain control of our lives and of our nation. But first, an introduction to Australia One. We are a group of ordinary but dedicated Australians who have been working hard since the end of 2019 to create a political party capable of leading Australia out of its current suicidal trajectory and onto a path that will build a brilliant future for our children and our grandchildren. We already have well over 8,000 supporters ready to get to work to take back our country. But before we go any further, allow me to ask you some questions that you might like to consider. How do you know what you know about the current state of affairs in the world? How do you know it is the truth? How would you know if they were lying to you? Why is this important? Well, because in the coming weeks, months and even years, Disturbing revelations and events in Australia and across the world will undermine your faith in most of what you believe to be true. Reputable institutions, as well as powerful people you have trusted your entire lives, and perhaps even loved, will be revealed as despicable and corrupt, and your understanding of life on earth and your place in it will be shaken. Some of you will look away, refusing to believe what you see with your own eyes. This response, though understandable, will be unhelpful. We must face the truth. On the other hand, the revelations, as upsetting as they might be, will come as almost a relief to those people who have for some time suspected, but could not prove, deception on an inconceivably large scale. This brings me to why we are speaking to you today. During this series, we will discuss not only the parlous state of our nation and how we lost control of our birthright, but most importantly, we will reveal our plan and the actions we must take together to restore Australia to the Australian people. In later episodes, we will discuss specific and detailed policy positions, which will return Australia to what it was at its best, that is, a nation supportive of children and families, liberty and sovereignty, and finally, decency and unity. But tonight, let's start at the beginning. This first episode is entitled, entitled Australia Contra Mundum, or Australia Against the World because that is exactly where we are as a nation. In this episode, we will discuss the situation as we see it, our intention, and finally, how and why we know that with your help, we will succeed. So without any further ado, let us begin. Australia is at war. For decades, Australia has been under sustained attack by malevolent foreign forces, and these foreign forces have been aided and abetted from within by traitorous and seditious Australians. This barbaric yet meticulously planned and patiently executed assault is now approaching its final stages. We, the Australian nation, that is our people, as well as the Australian state, our institutions, are now at our most vulnerable. Those of us who understand the threat know we are almost defenceless, but compounding this perilous situation is the ignorance of most Australians to the scope, scale and nature of our adversaries' plans. They have, with malice of forethought, laboured to diminish us in all possible ways. As individuals, they have attempted to degrade us physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and even spiritually. As a nation, they have attempted to weaken us militarily, economically, culturally, socially, and morally. We are at war for our very survival, because our adversary's object has not been only the conquest of land, the control of resources and our enslavement. But they also intend that we, 
most of the common people of the world are eliminated from the face of the earth. This war is unlike any war we have ever fought. Why is this so? Because it is a a war of conquest but without battle. First, it is an undeclared war. We against whom it is being waged have been completely unaware that we have been under this sustained attack, and most have not suspected it. So subtle are their methods. Second, it is a dirty war. It is covert and clandestine in its nature and has been directed by those who remain hidden in the shadows. They fight without courage, without honour, without constraint, without mercy and without humanity. Third, this is a coward's war. They fight ruthlessly against the innocent, against those incapable of defending themselves, against all who stand in the way of their agenda, knowingly or not, and they make no distinction for age, gender or circumstance. Four, it is a traitor's war because those enforcing this foreign agenda upon us are our very own treasonous politicians, bureaucrats, judges, police and military who are in the pay of the Australian people and yet who betray us. And they are aided and abetted by traitors in the media, academia, religious faiths, as well as business and industry. Five, it is a total war, because our adversaries will do anything and everything to achieve their object. Their degeneracy knows no limits, and their malformed minds acknowledge no boundaries. Their form of warfare is a return to pre-biblical barbarism. What sort of people could do this? We can easily imagine a psychopathic military warlord conquering nation after nation, terrorizing millions of people for their own greater glory, because history is replete with such people. We can equally imagine psychopathic political leaders establishing murderous dictatorships over their nations, killing millions of their own people, because we have also seen them throughout history. So too can we imagine imagine psychopathic religious leaders subjugating countless people in the name of their God, because we have also seen them throughout history. Is it possible then that psychopathic business leaders possessing all the same callous desires and malevolent ruthlessness as their military, political and religious counterparts might establish business empires with the goal of accumulating all the wealth there is and as part of that process exterminate, as they see them, the useless eaters that might stand in their way? Of course it's possible. And finally, is it possible that a group of these military, political, religious and business psychopaths could collaborate in order to divide up the world between them? Sadly, again, the answer is, of course. Now, some of you might be saying to yourself, this just cannot be true. And for those of you who cannot believe this is possible, it is likely you have a good heart and cannot fathom such depravity. But those of us who have lived and worked and traveled through the less wholesome and respectable places on the planet, we know it is not only possible, we know it is happening, right here and right now. Our adversary comprises many disparate groups at different levels. But for the purpose of this presentation, it is enough to know that while the agenda has been planned at a much higher level, it is being executed primarily by China, Islam, Communism, globalist organisations and transnational corporations. Here in Australia, the people are manipulated into agreeing with and accepting their plans by the corrupted political parties and the equally corrupted media. How have our adversaries prosecuted this war? Well, the battlefield upon which this war has been and is still being fought is not just in the military domains of sea, land, air or even the cyber and space domains. Because our adversaries make no distinction between combatants and non-combatants, and because every man, every woman and every child in this country has been the target of their malevolent intentions, this war has also been and is also being fought in our political, economic, cultural, social and human domains. In accordance with their stated and published plans, which you can easily find online, and please note many of these words are their words, not mine, In the political domain, they have taken control of all political parties, ensuring, regardless of which party wins power, the agenda continues to move forward. Consider, for example, the unrelenting increase in foreign control of Australia. 
They have done away with loyalty oaths and watered down definitions of treason and sedition. They have infiltrated the media, editorial writing and policy making positions. In the economic domain, they have infiltrated and gained control over unions and big business. They have destroyed Australia's manufacturing industry by destroying inexpensive and reliable base load power via coal fired power stations. They have made family owned farms commercially unviable by illegally and unconstitutionally trading water rights, resulting in some cases a tenfold increase in the price of water. In the cultural domain, they have gained control of key positions in radio, television and motion pictures. They have consistently discredited Australian culture. They have taken control of art critics and directors of art museums, promoting ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art, and shapeless, awkward and meaningless forms. In the social domain, they have discredited the family as an institution, encouraged promiscuity, degeneracy and easy divorce. They have emphasised the need to raise children away from what they consider the negative influence of parents. They have used riots to foment public protest to create the impression of public support for their agenda. Consider, for example, Black Lives Matter. In the human domain, they are forcing the injection, under the lie of the false COVID pandemic, of untested mRNA experimental gene therapies, which will alter forever the real DNA structure of both adults and children. They have taken control of teachers' associations, softened the school curriculum and put their agenda in textbooks. Consider, for example, safe schools, transgenderism and sex training, not sex ed, for primary school age students. They have empowered school principals and teachers to interfere with children's physical and psychological development without the knowledge or permission of the parents with respect to the child's gender identity. The weight of this unrelenting assault is so great that many people will be persuaded to agree with the agenda. Those who are not persuaded will be bullied until, believing they cannot win and that the wholesale adoption of the agenda is inevitable, they will, for the sake of a quiet life, concede defeat. Now, are you beginning to understand why it is a case of Australia contra mundum? If we Australians do not halt and then reverse this unrelenting attack on every aspect of our lives, we will lose everything we love. Our children, our families, our freedom, our jobs, our businesses, our wealth, our homes, our land, our nation and our lives. All we are and all we have will be taken from us. Will their plan fail? Of course. Why am I so confident? An answer was eloquently provided by Sir Winston Churchill in a speech he delivered at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on the 31st of March 1949. He said, the machinery of propaganda may pack their minds with falsehood and deny them truth for many generations of time. But the soul of man, thus held in trance or frozen in a long night, can be awakened by a spark coming from God knows where, and in a moment, the whole structure of lies and oppression is on trial for its life. Peoples in bondage should never despair. Science, no doubt... if sufficiently perverted, exterminate us all. But it is not in the power of material forces in any period, which the youngest here tonight need take into practical account, to alter the main elements in human nature or restrict the infinite variety of forms in which the soul and genius of the human race can and will express itself. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Churchill had it right. Our adversaries see us as sheep to be shorn and cows to be milked and then discarded when our usefulness is spent. But all we need do is to trust ourselves to release that fiery spark of unique individuality that each one of us possesses, which rests in every human soul and which is the creative force for all that is good. Despite all that has been done to us, we will fight and we will win this war. But it must be fought with law and reason, and patience. And in reversing every one of their gains, we will achieve a momentous victory for our children and grandchildren. Let me now describe Australia One's intention. 
And intention comprises three parts, purpose, method, and end state. Purpose is what we have to do. Method is how we will do it. End state is the list of criteria we must achieve in order to be successful. In other words, what the world would look like once we are finished. Well, at Australia One, our purpose is to save Australia. It's as simple as that. Our method is to create a moral par political party that empowers Australians to reach their highest individual potential so that collectively all can participate in the reformation of Australia. This is the only approach that will succeed. A political force genuinely deriving its just powers from the consent of the people and harnessing their combined efforts to reform and rebuild the nation. Our end state is that Australia is a moral, sovereign, self-reliant Christian Western democracy which is economically powerful, militarily intimidating, politically free, culturally vibrant and socially cohesive. Now please note that our end state is not a marketing or public relations statement but a checklist that must be achieved. In reforming Australia, every potential policy we consider must contribute to the achievement of at least one criterion or better still, two or more criteria of the end state. If a policy does not do this, it is rejected. As you can see, our intention is grand in scope and scale, but this is necessary to defeat the strategy which has been at work against Australia, which is no less monumental. Has this approach succeeded in the past? Of course. The American colonists in the US Revolutionary War challenged and defeated Great Britain, the greatest superpower of the day. Despite a Congress incapable of outfitting and sustaining the Continental Army, and despite the fact that Washington's army had at best support from only 20% of the population, colonists won through sheer dedication of the common man and common woman who sacrificed all for their freedom. We here today in Australia face no less of a challenge, and once again the common man and common woman are rising with the challenge. Every day, more and more Australians are communicating in no uncertain terms that their patience with the corrupt, lying and incompetent politicians is running out, and they will soon feel the indomitable and explosive spirit of the average Australian. We don't need everybody, we just need enough. How can we possibly win? Well, we are warned almost daily that we face a battle of biblical proportions, David facing Goliath. But unlike the Israelites who said that Goliath was too big to defeat, we are more like David, and we see Goliath as too big to miss. Let me explain. First, we will win the people. We have a constitution the likes of which has ne never been seen in Australian politics. It empowers the membership to fully participate in the running of the party, moving any removing any possibility that it will be taken over by donors and special interests by including the members' right to recall elections. Any party official or candidate that loses the confidence of the membership will be removed and be required to recontest his or her position. Second, we will win elections. We have a full range of policy proposals that will put Australia first and give back to the people their rights, their money, their land and their freedom. As I said earlier, I will describe the policies in full in later episodes, but for now I'll briefly describe some key policy objectives. We will return sovereignty to the Australian people by conducting a true constitutional convention in order to allow them to determine how and by whom they will be governed. We'll return Australia to a position of strong self-reliance rather than dependency on other nations who subsequently hold us to ransom. We will strengthen Australia's position as a Christian Western democracy, ensuring the principles of philosophy and morality that created us continues to be understood and protected. We will recreate the conditions for all Australian industries to be competitive internationally by firstly removing all income and other indirect taxes and replacing them with a single and simple 2% expenditure tax. Secondly, by withdrawing from all agreements relating to carbon pricing and renewable energy generation and requiring states to be self-reliant and use their own resources to generate their own power. We will ensure we are able to defend Australia and her interests independent of allies by creating a full spectrum offensive and defensive military capability in the sea, land, air, special operations, cyber and space domains. We will ensure Australian people are free to live their lives in accordance with their desires, subject of course to respecting the rights of others. We will ensure an active non-racist immigration program attracting the best and brightest from around the world to Australia, ensuring priority is given to those who are most culturally suited to our nation. 
We will ensure that all Australians, regardless of their country of origin, know of and are proud of their Australian home, history and culture. We will also give due regard to Australia's First Nations, ensuring we are all part of one country, one people with one flag. Who is supporting Australia One? Well, we have attracted and assembled a leadership team with a combination of integrity and skills unprecedented in Australian politics. We are all beholden to no one but to Australia and the Australian people. As I said, we already have over 8,000 supporters ready to go. Australia's young and old from many different countries of origin, all walks of life and from all sides of politics have joined us already, attracted by Australia One's sound and moral philosophy, coupled with a pragmatic and hard-nosed approach to returning Australia to her former glory. Australia One has no debts and owes no favours, and our ob only obligation is to the Australian people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to listen to Law of War Part 1, Australia Contramundum. As you have seen, it really is a case of Australia against the world, but I know we can do this together. During my 24 years in the Army and 23 years in business, I've had the privilege of collaborating with many great, hard-working, imaginative and capable Australians, and I know from my lived experience what we as a people can do when we need to do it. I'd like to finish with the words of one of Australia's great soldiers, George Mansford, who worked his way up from the rank of private to brigadier. You might not, might not know of Warrie George, but you should know that his legacy, summed up in the following words, which he wrote many years ago, lives on in the hearts and minds of countless diggers. He wrote, The oath to serve your country as a soldier did not include a contract for the normal luxuries and comforts enjoyed within our society. On the contrary, it implied hardship, loyalty and devotion to duty regardless of rank. Ladies and gentlemen of Australia, it is time for you to serve your country in whatever way you can. When we win, and we will win, we'll be part of what Australian history will call the greatest generation. Thank you again for your time today and I will see you next week for part two of Law of War, A Moral People. Good morning.